So hello everyone once again. Good afternoon this time. And our third speaker is Ben Lewis Evans, the man who represents Epic Games. He is a user experience researcher there and he, he has a PhD in human factors psychology and also boasts more than 13 years in game development. And he has worked on more than, let me remember, 75 games from indie titles to mobiles and to AAA games. So please welcome Ben. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, here's the title of my talk, just so you can check you're in the right place. Uh, to start with, to introduce, uh, as has just been said, my name is Ben. I'm a UX researcher at Epic Games. I have a PhD in psychology, which has included teaching in neuroscience departments. I'm also a Kiwi, which means I come from New Zealand, a fruit. If you want to contact me, you can reach out at uh, this email address or uh, reach out to me on Twitter to play video. So please uh, feel free to add me on any of these services here. Uh, I know that it's in the CIS region and easy to play with and welcoming, so I look forward to that. All right, so to start off my talk, I want to start with this, this statement, a shot of dopamine. It's something I hear quite often people say that a game mechanic gives people a shot of dopamine. And what do they usually mean by this is they usually mean that something's pleasurable or addicting or that something that people have seen in a game uh, is making them feel good. This idea is about mm, 30 years out of date. Dopamine is not really thought to have anything to do with pleasure anymore, and research has moved on since then. It takes quite a while to move through all this research, and I'm not going to do it here, but certainly this idea that dopamine is a pleasure chemical, that you can get shots of dopamine, has become popular uh, in kind of general pop science. And you get all these neuro things that are pop up and get, popping up everywhere, like neuro training, neuro food, neuro exercise, neuro marketing, all these neuro things. And all these things that you can pay for uh, online, and they'll give you information that's supposed to be uh, somehow special because it's got the word neuro in front of it. Now, uh, people working in neuropsychology and, and neuroscience in general have kind of started to label this neuro trash. Now, the reason they say this is not necessarily that all these things, are, these things are wrong. It's just that they can be a little bit overhyped. And I think that this statement is one that I quite like that sums up why these ideas might not be as straightforward and worth paying for as they often put out. And that's that if for us to understand, we would be so simple that we couldn't. Now, that's not to say that studying the brain isn't worth it. It is. But the fact is that it's not that simple, right? If anyone comes and tries to tell you like simple things like a shot of dopamine or that dopamine is a pleasure chemical, they're probably simplifying things or they're misunderstanding. But why do we care about these things as game developers, right? I mean, we like science. Uh, I have a PhD, I like science. Science is really cool. And so we care about these things and we want to make better games. So. Maybe we want to look at statements like this. Rewards delivered on a variable schedule strongly motivate players due to activating a complex web of neurons, blah, 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 neurotransmitters. It sounds cool. It sounds very fancy. But working in games, what we really care about is that first part, right? The behavior. Rewards delivered on a variable schedule strongly motivate players. Full stop. We don't really need to know what's happening inside their brains. In fact, a lot of work in neuroscience is to take these existing ideas of what we already know about how people act from psychology and then work out the physiology of that, right? What's happening in the brains. And that's really useful for neuroscience because we know, hey, we already know that this happens. Let's work out the physiology of why that happens. But if we already know that it happens, then in game design, we don't really need to go any further. So that's kind of just the introduction. I really want to say we can throw away these new, uh, dopamine shots. We don't need them. Okay. And then we can talk about rewards and motivation. And what we already know in science that works, that neuroscience is often looking at. And just to give you an idea that even this is not so simple, is this is my wall during my PhD. Now, during my PhD, I found every single theory I could find in the little bit of, of human behavior I was looking at, which happened to be driver behavior. And this was at a set point of time, and I put these on my wall just to show myself how much how many different models, how many different theories there were that tried to explain just this one part of human behavior. 
And this was just a snapshot at one point of time. There's more than this. And this can feel quite overwhelming, especially if you are looking for straightforward answers. But what you can do is you can look not necessarily to just one model and try and make that the model that solves everything, but you can look across all these models and try and find where they agree. So that's what I've tried to do, where these models agree in terms of reward uh, and motivating people, which is what we want to do when people play games. Now, this is kind of what I'm going to cover. You don't have to read all of it, but I'm going to start with feedback on the come of actions is important. And I want to start with this because it's really the key, the most important part uh, of rewards. Feedback, feedback, feedback. If players don't know what they've done to get a reward, then they don't know how to do it again. If they don't know why they got a reward and how they got a reward, then again, won't seek it out, they won't continue to play the game, they won't work for the reward. And if they don't know the value of the reward, and this is most often where I see uh, games have issues, is they make it really clear, you got a reward, and here's how you got it, but not what to do with that reward, why it has value within the game. If they don't understand that, then again, they won't work for the reward, they won't find it rewarding. And as a basic principle, rewards are feedback. That's what they are, you do something, you get something good. That's feedback on your success or what you've been doing. And in fact, most feedback can be rewarding if it's delivered in certain ways. But rewards fundamentally are feedback. And that's why I'm here talking as part of a UX session, because usability and clarity of feedback is a core part of user experience work. Therefore, understanding reward and how reward should be delivered is also a core part of what UX professionals should do. And just to give a little reward, you're a really wonderful audience. I can tell you're paying attention and thinking critically. Thank you very much. So we can look at these basic ideas, and we can go back to really basic ideas of around feedback and delivering reward. And there's learning principles. Classical conditioning is one of them, and this is kind of responding to a reward. It's when you learn to link one existing thing uh, with a new idea. So if we look at this, seeing the coin is probably rewarding for a lot of people. Hearing the sound, is also probably rewarding for a lot of people. And we can put those two things together. All right, stop that sound. Um, and these have become paired with your action of playing the game. And now either one of them is rewarding because through the action of the game, collecting these things was good. Right. A kind of practical example of this is the use of real world currencies in games for premium currencies. Quite often people will use gems, gold, um, money, that kind of thing to represent a premium currency. And why this has value as a reward system is players have already been conditioned to think that this is valuable, right? Gold is valuable, gems are valuable. We already have that conditioning from our everyday life. And that means that as a game developer, you can use that conditioning and bring it into your game and people will understand that this has value. You can use uh, currencies that aren't real world, but it will be a little bit harder for you to establish that uh, this is something that is rewarding. Another example is idle games uh, or clicker games. And here, we, by playing lots of games in everyday life, has, have learned, have been conditioned that numbers going up is good. So just seeing numbers going up, even without us really doing anything, is rewarding for us. But classical conditioning is relatively simple. We actually want to do things um, that help people learn and get a little bit more complicated than that. So you can look at operant conditioning for this, and this is responding to get a reward. So it's not responding for a reward, it's um, to a reward, it's responding to get one. And there's various types that this can take. Um, I'll go through the, the four classic ones. There's fixed ratio. Now fixed ratio, uh, a typical example of this would be in a turn-based game where you set a unit building and it has 10 turns to go until it's built. And that's 10 constant responses of you clicking the next turn button until you get the reward of having the unit. It's also clicks in a clicker. These are a very simple kind of every few responses you get a reward. And if we draw that out on a graph, what it tends to look like if you look at the response rate and the number of actions is you get a relatively steady number of responses until the reward is delivered, which is the tick. And then what happens is people tend to stop responding for a little bit because they've got 
say if it was 20 clicks, they've now got another 20 clicks in front of them, and it tends to be a little bit like, okay, I just worked hard to get to this point, now I take a relax, and now I start working again towards the next point. But that's a fixed ratio, and what a lot of the turn-based games do is they make sure that you have a lot of fixed ratios all going at the same time, so that this dip is never just happening all at the same time, you've got really nothing to do. When they can cross over each other, that's good. Now, variable ratio is probably the most famous. Here we've got an example of it in Fortnite, where it's used for the llamas. Uh, these are kind of loot drops or random uh, loot crates. And a variable ratio is where there is a, a variable number of responses you have to do until you get the reward you're after. So with the llamas, you may not get what you want every single time. You have to open them a few times. And they even have a mechanic where they can upgrade when you hit them. So you go to open them, and they turn silver or gold. Critical hits is a more um, kind of moment-to-moment -moment thing of a variable ratio. If there's a critical hit system in your game, every hit people do, there's a chance it's a critical, and then eventually it may actually get there. If we look at these, the reason these are famous is that quite often the ratio is used in gambling, and the response they tend to get is a very constant and kind of high-level response. And that's because you don't know how many times uh, you have to respond before you get the reward, so people tend to keep it up. It's not predictable like fixed ratio is, so it doesn't tend to lead to these big dips in value. Now, the other way you can look at it instead of responses is interval or time when the rewards are delivered. So the first one those is fixed interval, and this could be thought of as appointment gaming. So this is when there's set loot or monster times, there's set world events, or there's daily logins or timers. So uh, that's the examples I've got up here. These are the daily logins from Fortnite and Paragon. And what this says is come back at this time and you get rewarded. And there's no point in doing anything else until the next time that comes around. So unsurprisingly, this is what you tend to get response curves, right? You get the reward, then you completely stop responding, and then close to the time where you feel like you're going to get the next reward, say you know the monster's going to spawn in five minutes' time, at about like 4.30, uh, go and stand over by where the monster spawns and wait a little bit. So you get a little bit of responding. And then the big amount of responding is at the point that it happens. The other one is variable interval. This is uh, event-seeking behavior. It would be unpredictable loot or uh, spawn times, randomized world events. We have some of these in Fortnite. They're not really particularly rewarding. Um, but they are kind of patrols that appear in the world at, at random times. And you have to deal with them. Not or when they're going to happen, but you do have to take precautions or act against them. And what that tends to do is get this kind of uh, lower level but relatively constant responding rate again, because you never know when uh, a behavior is going to be rewarded or not. So if we look at all of these, it can be tempting for game developers to just go, oh, well, the variable ratio is the best, right? It's the highest, it's the most constant, so we should just make everything random, um, everything variable. And that's the best approach to take. Actually, the best approach is to combine these schedules together, make sure that there's always a little bit of certainty there for players, so fixed intervals or, or fixed ratio things. People like to know that a certain amount of behaviors will, will, will be rewarded. And the variable ones, they can lay on top of that for the random rewards, the random loot, the things that people find quite compelling. And moving on with this in terms of feedback, we also have to consider when rewards are given. Um, in terms of timing, if you want to reward people for success or progress or making a choice, feedback and reward on that should be basically immediate. It needs to be coupled with the reward. Otherwise, people are quite bad at learning. Say, I, uh, I say something funny, and then 10 minutes later, you laugh. That's not going to reward me. It's not going to make me feel good that my joke landed. I I'm just probably going to get confused. And if you do want uh, systems that take a long time to reward the player, like leveling up, for example, in a game, then you need strong feedback support, right? Leveling up in an RPG is really rewarding. You get a bunch of stuff. But we use XP bars as little chunks of feedback, little bits of reward as you move towards that bigger one to keep people motivated, to keep people uh, aware of what's going on. The other idea is un uncertainty or unexpected rewards. Now, unexpected rewards are quite motivating. There's quite a lot of research that says that if you can deliver awards unexpectedly to people, they find them uh, compelling and motivating. Uh, one example of this could be in puzzle games, where people are able to come up with a suggestion 
uh, or a solution within the puzzle game that they feel like um, came out of nowhere or, or, or was random. That can feel very rewarding to people. But uh, the problem with uncertain rewards or unexpected rewards is they can become predictable. So, for example, this is an unexpected reward of a cat. It's a very cute cat. But if in, say, six or seven slides, I showed you another picture of a cat, it probably wouldn't be very unexpected anymore, and it probably would lose some of its impact. Now, another thing I want to talk about with, in terms of feedback, uh, feedback as a reward, is also feedback from just the act of playing the game as rewarding to players. This is also an area that is sometimes forgotten when talking about reward. Often, uh, when there's talks about rewards, it's very focused on external systems, on metagame uh, systems, these kind of things. But it's really important to recognize that game feel, the feedback people get from playing a game, can be very motivating and very strong reward. So just some examples of that. We've got the, the screen shake from the Space Marine moving in the game Space Marine, right? It's like thunk, thunk. And all the player's doing is pushing forward on the stick, and it just feels good. Destiny is a great example of this. They spend a lot of time making their animations feel good. All the player is doing is pressing a button, but it feels like they're reaching out into the world and making an impact. This is something we feel is really important for Epic, so we try and put it in our games. So this example is from Fortnite. Fortnite's a harvesting game, and harvesting just the way is really boring. So we've got a mechanic where as you're harvesting, you hit these little blue dots, and they make you harvest faster, and they move around, and it take, changes this kind of tedious activity into something that is a little bit of a mini game, a little bit like we did in Gears of War with active reloading, where you could get a bonus from reloading at the right time. Another kind of more basic example is in Paragon. Paragon uh, is our MOBA, and we try and say it's the MOBA that puts you in the action. And so we put a lot of emphasis on making our characters move with physicality. So when you're pressing those buttons and using their abilities, it really feels like they have weight and they're making action happen in the world. And this is rewarding for players and motivating. Another p important part of uh, feedback is to give feedback towards progression. Again, I kind of mentioned this earlier when we were talking about um, reward timing, but it's really important that you provide progress towards clear goals, either that the players set themselves or that you are uh, uh, setting up within the game. It's rewarding for players to see progress, but it does very strongly rely on feedback. And progression is something that we do a lot in our current two games of, of Fortnite and Paragon. We have a lot of progression systems set up. We have leveling up of things. Uh, when you're playing the game and going through the quests, we have this very strong progression map that shows you where things are going and what your next rewards will be. We tick off what you've done in the past. In Paragon, we have daily quests and monthly quests and things just to keep you a little bit engaged and a little bit uh, brought in. Progression is really often used in tutorials as well. And good use of progression in tutorials can be really rewarding to players. For example, this is the jumping tutorial in uh, Unreal Tournament, the current one. And one of the things that's really nice about this in terms of progression is it shows you clearly where you need to go. It shows an example of what you need to do. But also, and this is a, a, a common thing in well-designed tutorials, is you can't actually progress out of this room without showing that you can jump, because you need to get over the barrier that's right there. So it's a really good natural feedback system for the player that I've learned how to do this, I've progressed, I've jumped, I've got out of the room. That's a dog, not a cat. All right. We can also look at social comparison and progression. Now, this is an example uh, from 2. When they re revamp their post-game reward systems and their post-game feedback systems, they included these graphs that let you sh see how your progression over the path of the game compares with other people. Now, you can only see this at the end of the game, but it can be quite rewarding to see this, right? Uh, the Viper player did better overall through most of the game, and that feels good. It did feel good. It was me. All right. But the problem with social comparison, and the reason why Valve leaves this till the end of the game, is it can open the path to abuse. So people tend to uh, like to feel like they're on top, but they don't like feeling that they're below, and they don't like hanging out with people that are than them. Um, so an approach to this can be shown at the end of the game. Typically speaking, it's a good idea to hide MMRs rather than show them at the start of a game and to make stat tracking websites opt-in if possible. So that means that if you want to look up another player and see how bad or good they are, 
It's not really uh, possible unless they've decided to let their stats be tracked by external websites. An interesting trend in social uh, comparison and progression has actually been to kind of remove the social element and feedback just related to the player themselves. So Overwatch does this, and based on research, this is a good direction to go in because uh, if I'm comparing to other people, there's a chance that I stuck. But if I'm compared against myself, you can quite often find a bunch of metrics to show that I've improved or I've done something good this game that maybe I hadn't done in previous games. So Overwatch, for example, will say, hey, you, this is your third best healing or your best healing ever or things like that. And Dota 2 uses this as well to compare your performance on a certain hero over your average performance. So that's feedback. And again, feedback is really important. It's kind of the key to reward systems. And it goes through the rest of this talk, but I'm going to move on to some other areas. So control and choice is important, um, is the next area. And this kind of feels common sense, but it has a little bit of nuance to it. Essentially, we like to feel we have choice and control. It's something uh, about human nature. We like to feel that we make a difference and we're choosing to do what we want. We dislike feeling limited, controlled, or most importantly, out of control or lost. Now, there is an exception to this. That is, unless we've chosen to be controlled or limited. If we choose to give up a bit of control, say by making choices within a skill tree that locks off other points of the skill tree, that's okay. We've made a choice. It's only if it's a we feel like it's imposed upon us that there can be problems. So there's ways you can highlight this in games. You can talk about control and choice and story. This is what comes up quite often. And you can go as extreme as The Witcher 2, where a whole act, a whole huge chunk of content is missed, depending on if a player makes uh, one choice or another. This is a lot of development work, but it is a very effective way of making players feel in control. But you don't have to go that far. We can look back at The Walking Dead. Now, these series have been done a lot, so kind of the illusion around them has faded. When the first Walking Dead came out, people praised it on its choice of its feeling of control, of how much you felt like you had agent within the game. But really, if you go back and play it a few more times, you'll find out that the game pretty much plays out the same way, no matter what choices you make. But the important thing is how they presented the choices. They present them as very meaningful. They tie them up in story. They put timers on them to try and force you to make decisions quickly. They give you feedback on your choices. And this makes you feel like you have a lot of control. Now, a similar game that was also praised for having a lot of control and freedom was Journey. But Journey is essentially just a linear progression through a bunch of maps. There isn't any choice, really, at all in the game. But because you have a lot of freedom to express yourself within the, in the various areas as you move around, again, people felt that this was a game that gave them choice and freedom. So there are different ways of handling this. It doesn't have to be as extreme as Witcher 2. Um, but it's very much dependent on what you want to achieve. You can also use um, this idea of control uh, or feeling in control in your systems and your games that are aimed at reducing toxicity or negative behavior. This is the example of the system we send, a uh, message we send to players in Paragon. If we've actioned a player that they reported, it's got a little bit of story there. It's got one of our characters who's a police officer saying that we've arrested people. And it makes our players feel good. It makes them feel like uh, we're actually doing something and that we're listening to their reports. It makes them feel in control because what antisocial behavior and toxicity in video games does is it takes away control from people. They were having fun, and then this person comes in and crashes and uh, just ruins everything for them, and they feel out of control. They feel miserable. And this is a way of kind of bringing that control back to them, making them feel like they matter uh, and what they're saying matters. Feeling of control also interacts with activities and progression. So you've got lots of side missions, and they can be really good, but if players feel like they have to do the side missions, then it can feel controlling. Escort quests in games are often uh, hated by players, and that's because an escort quest takes away control from them and puts success in the hand that they have to protect. So modern games like uh, The Last of Us, which is essentially a long escort quest, have tried to get around this by making the escort quest basically unfailable by having the person you're escorting not be able to die. It's a trade-off between immersion, but uh, it lets the player feel in control more often. And control is also where grinding comes up. Uh, people don't mind doing repetitive actions in a game as long as they feel like they're progressing or it's rewarding. As soon as they feel like it's 
kind of required of them to be successful, that's when you start hearing about grind or grindy feel. Now, the important thing about this is I've always been feeling of control or trying to, and that's because that's what matters. It's not actual control. It's a feeling of control that players have to have in order for them to be happy. And certain games are really good at this. Uh, match three games in particular, they have this great feeling when you get this cascade that you've done something important, but you have no control of what's going to drop down off the top of the screen. But when this happens, it feels really cool. It feels like you did something, right? And same with pachinko kind of games. You launch the ball, it bounces around, and it feels like you made an important choice. And that's really what's needed is to get this, this player feeling of control. It's not necessarily that you do give them absolute control over everything. Uh, before I finish up in control, one interesting area is the area of counter control. This is an old idea, and it's uh, that when people feel controlled, we often act counter to that control. We try and break that control. And this can be a bad thing because it's why people stop playing games if they feel like it's too controlling or too grindy. But it can actually be a mechanic that you can use in your games if you're clever. Uh, an example of this is the Stanley Parable. If you haven't played this game, the whole game is basically uh, you walk around inside a building and a narrator tells you things like you'll approach two doors and the narrator will say Stanley went through the door on the left. And you can choose what to do. You can go through the door on the left or you can break the control and go through the door on the right. And that's the whole game. The whole game is counter control. It's very rewarding to play through the game and ignore the narrator and have the narrator feel like they're trying to control you, they're trying to control you, and you keep breaking that control. And even though in this game you never break the control successfully, just that feeling of trying to break against it can be very motivating. And one thing I, I, I want to really stress about control, and this is a, a, an important thing, is a lot of people hear this thing about control and they say, well, then I'm not going to put a tutorial in my game or I'm not going to force my players to do things because they uh, don't like feeling uh, controlled. But the important thing is actually players like feeling in control and if they are lost or if they're out of control or if they're confused, then that's just as bad as if they feel overly controlled. So it's really important to have this little bit of tutorial, this little bit of hand-holding at the start of a game that lets people learn the competence, learn the skills that let them then feel in control. Otherwise, they can just feel uh, completely lost, and that's not good. One interesting way that we've done this in uh, the Unreal Tournament tutorial is that we have these optional tokens uh, throughout the tutorial. And what will happen is you'll be taught a mechanic, say jumping, and then in the next section, there'll be some jumping puzzles. But you don't have to do them, but if you want to, you have choice, you have control to do these optional jumping puzzles and collect some tokens that add up and they show how good you are at these things. They show your progression, they show that you've got choice, and they show that you've mastered a system. Another interesting idea in um, control is not contingent rewards. These are often called participation awards, and people can be quite negative about them. But non-contingent rewards that don't rely on performance are, can be actually quite motivating because they're often unsurprised, uh, they're often unexpected, and they can be useful in games. Probably um, a good example, but one that's hated by a lot of people, is rubber banding. Rubber banding is a non-contingent reward. It promotes people who are losing. The point of it in games like Mario Kart is to make the game fun because this is supposed to be a party game. It's not supposed to be a proper competition. You're supposed to kind of be interacting all the time. A more hardcore example of this is gold drips in MOBAs like Paragon. Gold drips in MOBAs mean that as people play a game, they're constantly getting a certain amount of gold as they play. They don't have to do anything to get it. They don't have to be playing the game well. They just do. And this helps balance the economy and keep things moving a little bit. And even if you're losing, it might just give you that little bit of gold you need to buy that item to win the next team fight. Another example of this is the latest uh, Titanfall 2, which came out a while ago now. In the first Titanfall, the only way you could earn your Titan mostly was through getting kills and being successful in the game. And that meant that some people, if they play particularly bad, would never get to experience the, the Titan, which is an important part of the game. In Titanfall 2, they introduced basically a drip, a Titan drip. And this means that even if you're playing poorly, you do get to experience this part of the game. You get to have a Titan probably at least once in a multiplayer game. So we do have to be careful about controlling people. 
but we do need to make sure that they feel uh, in control. And you're a wonderful audience. Don't worry about that listening clerically. It's, it's fine. Do what you want. Okay, I'm not going to do a bunch of slides on this statement. It's very simple. It stands by itself. Not getting a reward you expect can make a reward a penalty. And this is really important in terms of managing player expectations. If players have overcome a big challenge in your game, they will expect to be rewarded afterwards. If you do not deliver a reward that matches up to that challenge, um, then that can actually make what they did feel use useless or feel unrewarding to them. And this can often be a, a, a challenge in procedurally generated games where maybe the difficulty is very high and then the reward you get afterwards is completely random. If you can tie kind of the rewards people get to the difficulty of the task, then they'll be a lot happier. The next uh, part is that task adherent awards motivate more than task relevant. And really, a more simple way of putting this is that rewards that are meaningful to a player are motivating to players. Again, that's relatively simple. If a reward has meaning, has importance to a player, it, it, it motivates them more. And this can be where, again, players, uh, developers can have issues. Uh, one way to do this can be just to add some story or add some layer on top of it. So again, with the example of the llamas in Fortnite, they talk to you, they follow your mouse, they make stupid jokes when you go to hit them with the bat and break apart. This adds a little bit more meaning to what's just a task of opening a random loot box. Another example is uh, from the old game Crackdown. These, this game, you leveled up your character by doing things within the world. You did things that were important. And you collected orbs. So the agility orbs you collected via showing agility, via showing jumping uh, skill. And they increased your skill at jumping. So they were relevant. They immediately had value. And they were very highly valued by players. So really, the key of that is to show value. Personalize if you can. If you know what people like from their behavior within their game, you can offer them, say they buy a lot of skins, you can offer them sales on skins or promote skins to them, these kind of things. If you can show value to players, it's really important. And again, this is often where I see uh, games have difficulties, is they have great reward systems, but they never teach people what that reward is valuable for. Like you'll boot up a mobile game and it's like, oh, here's all this stuff. And then it's like never shows you how to spend the currency or use the stuff that it's given you. Uh, getting close to the end now, interacting with us positively is motivating. And I phrase this purposefully. Uh, if I beat you in a game that's positive for me, we'll count that as a positive interaction for at least one person. Um, we can compare performance with each other, and that's rewarding if it's in our favor. However, uh, it is also motivating if it shows progress against ourselves or it changes our expectations positively. But it can be demotivating if it is against us or changes our expectations of our performance uh, negatively. So if it's clear that I suck more than I thought I did, that's going to demotivate me. Uh, one example of this, it's not a reward thing, but it's, it's what Dota's trying to do here, where they show these uh, conduct summaries to people, and they say, uh, this person's got six reports, which means that uh, that's more reports than 94% of all players. So what they're trying to say to them is, you're abnormal, stop what you're doing, uh, what you're doing is not normal. And that can be quite effective. Uh, but you do have to be careful with this. This is a, a good player conduct. It says they have less than three reports. And it says that that makes them similar to 77% of the population. Now, that's kind of good. But somebody receiving this could say, oh, 28% of people are jerks. Yeah, maybe I can be a jerk too. And certainly, that's what's been found in research from um, power companies sending out letters that say that you use more, or you use less energy than your neighbors. The people who got the letters saying they use less energy will often start using more because they're like, eh, other people are using more so I can do it. Uh, that's my conduct summary. I'm a very good person. So now I'm going to get into a, a competition. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Competition, really popular in games. We all love competition. It's great because we're all winners. Uh, and competition can motivate those who think they can win with a potentially demotivational effect immediately after winning. So. As you strive towards winning, it's good. Often after the win, you see people get a little bit demotivated. And that's often because, again, you get a reward, and then often it's on like a fixed interval or a fixed um, ratio schedule that, uh, that competitions happen, and there could be a bit of a dip until the next competition starts. However, the risk with competition is it can demotivate those who don't think they can win, which will be a lot of your players. 
Uh, and this can be a common error in games of when you just dump people into a global leaderboard and yay, it's really motivating to be 31st thousandth in the world right now. That's super cool. But what you can do is you can uh, put people in local leaderboards leaderboards against their friends and try and mitigate this feeling of I'm not progressing, I'm not making any impact. And it's really important to think about the losers in your games. Often when we design games with competition, we only think about the winners and like, yeah, the, all this stuff. But what about the losers? Because they're going to be the majority. And one way to do this is to think about cooperation. Cooperation is, is quite popular in games now, but it has more room to grow. Cooperation is much more motivating than competition. It allows everybody to contribute, allows people to work together, and it encourages kind of community. We're a very uh, cooperative species. And you can do cooperative competition. You can have community goals where everybody's racing towards something, and the people who do the most get more reward than the people who do the least, but at least everybody gets something. You're working together for something you feel bigger uh, part than you are. It also allows for reciprocity, which I'm awful at saying, but this is basically the idea if someone does something nice for you, you're more likely to do it back. So uh, Game of War Fire Age uses this in terms of if anybody makes a purchase within a clan, everybody within that clan benefits from that purchase, which creates a feeling of, well, they purchased, I benefit, maybe I should buy something, and then they'll benefit. Similarly, in, in Destiny 2 that just launched, if you join a clan and anybody in your clan completes some of the events, like the raid or whatever, you get a reward, and it creates a feeling of, of um, community and working together and wanting to help each other, which can be very strongly motivating. You can also look at positive externalities. The idea behind this is purchases that you make benefit other people that you play with. So two examples, the minor examples from Paragon, is if you buy uh, what we call uh, hero mastery, then anybody who plays with you gets more progression with, just for playing with you. They don't have to do anything special. So if a lot of people buy these masteries, they convert into the game, then everybody that's in a game with them is getting boosted, at least their teammates. Um, and that could be a, an easy way to set this up. And then uh, the final thing, and again, no slides for this one because it's relatively straightforward and I've already given lots of examples of this, is that rewards can, in certain situations, de be demotivating. So to go back, back on that, things like if a reward feels really controlling, if it feels very uh, pushed upon a player, like good job, you did something really nice. Um, that can demotivate people, it can make them feel controlled, it can make them feel like uh, they don't have any power. And there's lots of other examples um, where if rewards don't match expectations, if they don't uh, beat the level of challenge that players have set, or if they're not connected well to value and meaning for the players, that they will not actually motivate in the way that you want. Okay, so I'm running out of time, but I just got to the summary. So the first part I want to say is, please, be neuroskeptical. When you see all this stuff, when you hear people talk about serotonin or dopamine or whatever it might be, be skeptical about this. The brain is not simple. Humans are not simple. But there are practical answers out there if you look for them. There's been uh, hundreds of years of research on this. And as I said at the start, neuroscience is often just looking at that research and trying to find the physiology behind it. The actual thing that they're looking at, the behavior they're looking at, is not new. Reward is feedback. Please provide feedback on rewards as close as possible to the behavior you want. If you can't, you need to provide little steps, little bits of feedback along the way until that reward is uh, guaranteed. If you think back to the different schedules of reinforcement, mix certain guaranteed rewards with rewards that feel more random. Don't rely on just one type of reward. If things feel too random, what that does is it makes players feel out of control. They don't feel like they have agency if everything is just random. So you need a little bit of certainty in there. Uh, control and value help people, players feel in control, but this does not mean not guiding or teaching players. Not guiding or teaching them uh, can mean that they feel out of control and show the value of your rewards and behavior. All right, thank you very much. And again, you can contact me here. Guys, if you have any questions, you're welcome. Hey, um, this is um, Jock from Wargaming Sydney. Um, I just wanted to 
less of a question and stuff, but just a comment as well. Like, it feels like a lot of this also applies to just like people management as well. Um, where, you know, like if a company, for example, gives rewards and it just doesn't, um, it's, it's, it, it becomes like a common thing where you just give a reward all the time and then it becomes monotonous essentially. And then it doesn't feel like a reward anymore essentially. Do you guys actually do something like that in, either in Epic as well for like people management as well? Since you guys are so familiar with this in, in the game environment. I'm not sure we've got to that uh, point within Epic. But certainly a lot of this research has come out of other disciplines. It's not game research. Like a lot of this is people management research or research on how people behave in different industries. And so it is widely applicable. Yeah, that's true. Certainly if, if a reward is given too often or if it loses its meaning, then uh, it no longer motivates. And that can be a lot of problem with this idea of gamification that's got out there is often it's using game mechanics but not understanding what is motivating about those game mechanics and the active play that's behind them and the rewarding feel that can come along with it is just setting up schedules and not really understanding it. Hello, thank you for awesome presentation. And uh, I wanted to ask a question about a very specific topic from your presentation, the one that you told about community goals. And from just experience in different games, community goals, though they are awesome thing, when you let community to build up together and work towards one goal, uh, if you like really scale them for a big audience, like for instance, World of, um, like in World of Warcraft Legions or in Helldivers, in any recent example, they doesn't really feel rewarding because you can you can barely see impact on that community goal. So if you like, do you maybe have an idea of if you want to use them, how such uh, like negative side can be overcome? All right, we're all grown up game developers here, right? Uh, fake it. Uh, Show bigger progression than is actually happening. Make sure that the community feels that they're making an impact. I understand that uh, like, when you run a big community goal, you set a goal, you think people are going to make it. Uh, maybe they don't look like they're going to make it, and you have to fudge the numbers. Think about that ahead of time. Think about how movement can uh, be shown within the goal for individuals. This can often also be uh, an issue outside of community goals. In terms of upgrade systems and games, often they can be decided, uh, designed so that, hey, this upgrade gives you plus 1.3% uh, boost your damage, which is, you know, if you're the spread guy and you enter that in, you're like, ooh, that's so good. Like, I really want that 1.3%. But gamers they don't really care. So you need to kind of um, make sure that the UI and the way that you're presenting it supports that by making it look more meaningful, making it look uh, bigger for players. Hello, thank you for a great talk. Danny, for Gaming St. Petersburg. Uh, can you please elaborate a little bit? As far as I understand, you are not a part of any particular game team, right? Or no, that's, that's right. Yeah, uh, can you please talk a little bit about the pipeline on how you convey this kind of knowledge to game teams and game design teams across the Epic organization? Right. Um, so UX at Epic is, is relatively new by my boss, uh, Celia uh, Hoden. And we're still kind of establishing our, our place within the organization. But at the moment, the way that I work is, is uh, closely with certain teams. Uh, I'm lead on uh, Paragon and on Battlebreakers at the moment, but I work across all the teams, including the engine. And what we do is we go to their meetings. Uh, we're involved in, in certain decision-making processes. So for example, I'm on the retention team as well as the anti-toxicity team and various other teams as we develop systems within the game. Um, and the important really thing is that we get involved early and that we build trust with our developers. And we're kind of uh, still very much in that stage of making sure that um, we're not the usability cops or the UX cops and we're just coming in and telling them they're doing bad all the time. It's more that we're a partner and we want to help them improve and help their intentions become reality. So that's at the point we're at at Epic. Um, other companies, uh, Riot, Ubisoft, things like that, they're a little bit more mature and they tend to do things like basically every major team has a UX person sitting on that team that just works with, with the people on that team constantly and is much more involved in the conversation. We haven't quite reached that point yet, but we're getting there.
Come on. One more. Um, okay, hello. Thank you for the presentation. I really liked it. Uh, I was thinking about toxicity that you mentioned in your presentation and its levels. Uh, it can seem like it has risen over the past years because many popular streamers uh, became, you know, overly toxic to please the audience. So I was thinking about mm, it's it's a problem, right? So when uh, you get into something like very competitive, like CSGO, Dota, or any major competitive title, it can be very um, toxic for new people and very hard to get into this, uh, you know, very tight circle of professionals. So um, it's it's very hard to, you know, deal with this problem. So even if we eliminate this toxicity entirely, like we ban every people who say the bad words and, you know, pressure people, wouldn't it be bad too? And how, you know, to find the balance between uh, right. being the good man guy and better guy? Okay, uh, that's a really big topic. I give talks on this topic as well. Um, but the, the short answer to it is you can make some progression in, in toxicity and we certainly have data that shows that um, when you're joining a game, if your first interactions are very toxic, it, it has a high chance of churning you out. No matter if you like the game or not, if you're exposed to toxicity, maybe you just go. Uh, so that's a problem. And um, you can do enforcement and things like that to, as you say, ban people or whatever. The problem with that is it can be um, hard to do uh, effectively. And also, actually, the truth is most toxicity is relatively, within a population, is relatively just once off from one person. But when you get a lot of people together, it becomes kind of a big cloud. But often it's just someone's had a bad day and they snap and they're toxic, and then they're never toxic ever again. So trying to get that via enforcement can be hard. So really the, the, the more difficult solution, but the more long-term solution is to try and um, build games in a way that don't allow toxicity to happen or don't encourage it so strongly. So a lot of competitive games will put all the emphasis on kills, even though it's a MOBA and it's about working together and capturing towers, right? But there's no emphasis on that. All the game systems are like, you get rewards for kills, you get glory for kills, and the game encourages that kind of behavior. Or you can look at, hey, you go into a game and voice chat is on by default. Well, why is voice chat on default? Why isn't it able to be opted into rather than opted out of? Um, so there are kind of engineering solutions or game design solutions that probably have a, a, a better path forward in terms of hold, uh, so solving that problem. So thanks, thanks everyone for the questions and thank you Ben for the great presentation. Thank you.
we are with one of our speakers who just uh, gave his speech here. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Alex uh, Shpilov. I am uh, head of uh, gaming and esports at wiki.com. Hi. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, so tell us, what's your favorite video game? Uh, well, at this moment my favorite game is Destiny 2. I have already spent a lot of hours in it and it's really awesome. It is, I gotta tell you. But this is a new game. What about the very first video game you've played? Do you remember it? The first game was uh, the first Quake. I played it with my dad <laughs> in my childhood. That's really great childhood memories, I guess. Uh, so uh, tell me, uh, how did you get to, uh, to the gaming industry? Uh, well, I was a um, user of some fan community about Steam and uh, Valve games, and uh, I began to translate some games from uh, some news articles and uh, so on from uh, English to Russian and. Uh, Valve invited, invited me to translate their games as a volunteer and after this I became such a dedicated uh, employee at Valve and now I'm here. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and what do you think about 4C? Uh, it's uh, my second 4C. I uh, have already visited 4C in Kiev uh, the last year and uh, it's really cool. I really love it. Well, I hope you love this one as well, and I hope you get lots of uh, new knowledge um, and share the knowledge as well. Did you have any questions uh, from the audience that you really liked? Yeah, uh, the audience was cool. They asked um, really cool questions, and I hope I, uh, it, my speech was really useful for them. It definitely was. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hi, we've got one of our speakers again and wanted to ask him some questions. Hi, introduce yourself, please. Hi, my name is Andrei Sarafanov. I'm a senior 3D artist from Wargaming. I'm working on World of Tanks project and creating 3D models of our tanks. Fantastic. Andrew, tell me, uh, what's the very first game that you've played? Do you remember it? Uh, actually, I think it was Tetris. Yes, I was amazed by the quality of the assets. <laughs> I love to play this game all the time, and uh, but later after I saw what computer games can do, I was mm, just I've tried to move to the PC gaming, and now I'm working on PC huge PC titles, and I love it. Well, that's uh, easy. Tetris had a fantastic destruction engine for its time, yeah. uh, but was it your favorite game, or which one is your favorite game of all time today? Uh, actually, today I like to play in, in, in our game Tanks, and uh, Tetris was more like uh, I had nothing to play, <laughs> only Tetris. And uh, today Tanks pretty much solves all my uh, wishes, and I, all, all I want I can find in this game. It's kind of simple, pretty fast. Not very long session, and I have a lot of time to work on my own own projects. So that's why I like to play the World of Tanks. Great. Uh, what led you to the gaming industry? How did you come to this uh, industry, to this job? Yeah, actually, I saw interesting 
CG artist challenge in the internet and I saw cool character art from different artists all over the world and I was amazed that uh, young guys can create uh, such amazing art so I decided to try this out and uh, I found that it's not very it's not that hard and I can learn that stuff and I did it as my in my st in my spare time just like a side project from my uh, main main job and uh, I was noticed by wargaming at, at some point and they invited me to join their team and now I'm doing tanks that sounds like a great deal uh, so glad to have you in the industry what's your favorite thing about it just about the game development yeah, I like um, the diversity of this uh, industry because it's, it changes a lot and it has a lot of different branches uh, all over the world, different people uh, creating very interesting experience and every year you need to adapt to the changes and uh, learn new things. And it, it is very... Um, uh, f fast moving industry and I, I, I love it because you need to learn every day. We definitely all love the industry but there are maybe some frustrations, something that you, you don't like that makes you sad in the state of the gaming industry today? Well, uh, maybe some tools are not developed enough to uh, meet our requirements so we have to do too much uh, technical work as an artist but uh, with every year, this uh, issue uh, resolves little by little. So I think it's pretty okay to work these days. So it's not, not a lot of problems, but a lot of fun. I agree with you there. It definitely change, uh, changes quickly. Uh, where do you think the industry will be like in 10 years' time? Uh, do you vision any trends? As far as I can see, uh, VR industry, uh, it didn't have a good start, but uh, it certainly takes space. Uh, I saw a lot of good examples for artists, like uh, software to paint in uh, virtual reality. It works really well, and uh, I think uh, through the special software, VR will take its place, and uh, at some point, uh, mo most of uh, game projects will go to VR in the future. So you think it's going to be the next big thing for everyone, right? Yes, of course, because uh, it's really immersive experience and uh, you don't have an, any boundaries in VR when you use VR headset. And it's, it slowly but surely takes, takes its place and I think we will be there. Yeah, the immersion definitely improves with both VR and just the quality of graphics. Uh, but do you think uh, the graphics are more important than the storyline or the gameplay maybe is in the front or a mixture of uh, some of these? Oh, you need to balance uh, every aspect of your game. Um, as an artist, I know that uh, a lot of details are not uh, that important. It's the more important the basic structure you want to show to the viewer and you need to have like basic shapes uh, which will be easy to read and uh, a narrative is a good example if you have a good narrative it will it, it can help you to support your characters and all your um, gameplay mechanics so i think you need to balance every aspect of your game and you will get success achieve success uh, do you have any vision of a game that you'd like to create if you weren't restricted uh, anyhow financially or creatively or professionally, just create anything? Yeah, and I'm not sure about the genre, but uh, in my spare time I want to create some universes. I'm, I'm doing it at the time and uh, maybe at some point I will make some game projects from the assets I've created. So. I'm working on it, but I'm not sure what will it be. Well, whatever it may be, I hope to, it turns out well for you. Um, but right now we're here in St. Pete. What do you think about the city? Uh, it's my second time in the city and uh, weather this time is much better. And I love it because the architecture is amazing. Never saw anything like, like this before. 
And uh, I love to visit museums. There is an artillery museum here. And I'm, as a tank artist, love to visit such um, exhibitions. I saw a lot of cool stuff and we'll visit the city again in the future, for sure. It's great that you like it, but as far as I understand, uh, 4C is one of the primary goals of your visit. Uh, what do you think about the, the event? Yeah, event was... Uh, I didn't expect that so much speakers will come in one place. And uh, I'm amazed by the quality of the um, organization structure so far. So, so far I love it. It's a very cool conference. Do you have a favorite question that you were asked before the the start of the conference yet? Favorite question? No, I don't have it. Uh, what would you ask yourself then? If you were interviewing yourself, uh, what would you like to open up with? Uh, what would you ask yourself? Well... I don't know. It's kind of a hard question for me. It's fine, but it's kind of a retrospective thing. Uh, and um, any presentation that you're particularly looking, looking forward to? Which one would you like to hear? Uh, I've met a couple interesting people here, and uh, I, I will attend their presentation for sure. But there are many of them, so I will not pick uh, any one of them. Well, I hope you get a favorite sometime along the line, and I hope you like the event overall. Thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>